Yeah, I, I got tested. I got booster shot with Moderna, so I can take off my mask. So. Yeah, this is only for Nathan, because I look better with the mask, but you have to bear with this this morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Larry. I'm, I'm a member here at Wellspring, and I'm, gl I'm really glad to be part of that Malama team, because I got a Zippy's card. Thank you. <laughs> And I got a chili and chicken dinner and shared it with my son and my wife. And uh, thank you for all the educators who are here and uh, people who support the educators. I have just one confession. <laughs> we were so slammed with registration and faculty meetings prior to the ending of the semester. I'm at West Oahu. Praise God, the message came at 6 a.m. Saturday. So hold on to your seats and get ready for a message. Because it's all about Jesus Christ and you. So this morning, um, the title that I have, uh, oh, wait, let me start my time because Nathan said I had to finish early. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I titled it Attitude of Ingratitude. And some of you are like, what? What is he going to say? Okay, just bear with me. This is a new twist from all the thankfulness. And uh, I took it from Psalms 95. And this morning, um, if you open up your Bibles, and you can read on the paper that you received, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and so let's dive in together. But before we start, Psalms 95, basically uh, from the book of Psalms, right in the middle, its authorship is traditionally assigned to King David. It is a reflection of how the righteous man prays for deliverance, not only for freedom from suffering, but to allow himself to be able to serve God without distraction. So, hear the word of God from Psalms 95, NLT, New Living Translation. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods, he holds his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands form the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. We are the people he watches over, the flock under his care. If only you would listen to his voice today. The Lord says, don't harden your hearts as Israel did at Meribah as they did at Massa in the wilderness. For there, your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw everything I did. For 40 years, I was angry with them, and I said, they are a people whose hearts turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in anger, I took an oath. We won't go through a Bible study of this, but I'll just grab verse 8. Thanks be to God for his word, that never fades or withers, but accomplishes its purpose. So, first of all, I just want to acknowledge Pastor Rebecca, Pastor Dan, and Pastor Cheryl, and I call him Pastor um, Pat also, and, and Robbie, um, for allowing me to speak on behalf of all the lay people, okay, as well as those who are continuing to shepherd our church. Um, thank you for this nice lay. So this morning, I, I took attitude of ingratitude was to share and explore the attitude, um, the way we think, the way we feel about someone or something. That's an attitude. And then of ingratitude, basically fancy word for ungratefulness. And the attitude of ingratitude basically makes it hard or even impossible to be grateful to God. So just sharing that ingratitude is being ungrateful, I'd like to share, because I was struggling through this, areas of the three things I'm going to share with you that made me ungrateful. But in this season, it turned me around to look at how I can be grateful, because God is constant. God in Christ Jesus is constant, bearing with me through this journey of life. So I'm going to share a scripture that depicts my ungratefulness. 
associated with other characteristics which are not pleasing to God. It comes from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 2. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. People will love themselves and money. They'll be proud and boast about themselves. They'll abuse others with insults. They will not obey their parents. They'll be ungrateful and against all that is pleasing to God. That's our scripture. And to add more fuel to the fire of this message is Benjamin Franklin. He said, most people return small favors. They return small favors. Acknowledge medium ones, greater ones, the greater ones with ingratitude. And that comes from Benjamin Franklin. It is possible that I was thinking that this pandemic, and probably you can think introspectively, has allowed me to be ungrateful in a lot of things. Honestly, I've taken people for granted. And somehow I want more. I don't know what the more is, but I want more. It's not satisfactory to me. It is a constant struggle that Paul finds in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, where the tension where he says, I want to do what is good, but I, I do the things that I don't want to do, the things that I hate. And so that's, there's this constant struggle with Paul, who, who speaks to us in our hearts that we want to do good for others, but we end up doing things that are not too good. Let's call a spade a spade, man. It's hard. And I will address the perspective that our struggles with ingratitude, it's a lifetime process of becoming grateful. So it's a process in becoming grateful, eventually to be filled with gratitude to God. That's the goal. That's the goal. So let's examine three perspectives uh, as I share about my struggle to be grateful to God. And um, please remember, please remember, my brothers and sisters and friends, that we all struggle with being ungrateful to God somewhere, sometime, somehow. And because of our human nature of sin, there is an innate default to be ungrateful. The sin within us that Paul speaks so strongly about. This is very true of me. So point number one, you can write down, ingratitude becomes disobedience. Ingratitude becomes disobedience. Um, what happens when God's people disobey God? You know, you start from the Israelites all the way. Um, because I married a Japanese woman, I learned the word monku. Okay. Um, monku, monkutaru, whatever they say. Complain, complain, complain. The Israelites were ichiban in complaining. Okay. The manna, no love's bread. The quail, what? No file mignon. <laughs> so, Psalms 95, verses 8 through 10. The psalmist says, today, in verse 8 to 10, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah. And Meribah was basically the word that meant strife. And um, it refers to a place in the wilderness, by the way. And as you did the day at Massah, Massah in Hebrew means the word tested. So you got strife and you're being tested. And it's another name given to the same location in recognition that Israel put God to the test as their provider. So the verse continues, as you did the day at Massah in the wilderness where your ancestors tested me, they tried me, though they had seen what I did. To me, plain disobedience. Monku, complain. Not good enough. I want more. So this is kind of like the reference to the rebellion. And as they traveled through the wilderness, these Israelites, they grumbled against the Lord because they found, guess what? No H2O, no water. Their complaints revealed the faithlessness in their hearts and contempt for God's holiness and provision in Exodus 20, 17, 2 to 7. And we must be very careful not to mimic their unbelief. The writer of the Hebrew quotes this verse three times to encourage believers to listen carefully to the 
Lord and to demonstrate their faith by obeying him. When we stop listening, we get into trouble. One of my co-workers posted a quote on his classroom wall, and the quote goes like this. The moment you settle for less than what you want is the moment you get more than you bargained for. The moment you settle for less, which I always do, to be honest, then what you want is the moment you get more than you bargained for. This is how it is with disobeying God. Once we settle for not going His way, we get less than what we imagined and more than we ever wanted. Isn't that so true? That's after the fact. Okay, It's like, after you go through it, oh yeah, God, you're right. I mean, that's me. Okay, I don't know about you, but you can join my club. I'm taking membership at the end of this, uh, not semester, but sorry, at the end of this uh, session. Okay, There's this pastor named Warren Wearsby. He refers to the complaining of the Israelites. He says that we harden our hearts when we see what God can do, but refuse to trust him so he can do it for us. We fail to also cultivate a godly heart that fears and honors the Lord. It is a grievous sin to ask for the gift and to ignore the giver. The consequences are painful. And all of us would say, absolutely. Let's look at disobedience with consequences directed to the Israelites and to Adam. In Deuteronomy 28.15, there's curses for disobedience that were upon the people, of the Israelites. It goes, however, if you do not obey the Lord, your God, and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. Okay, that's for us as a group of people. And now, in Romans 5.19, because of one man, and the one man you know is Adam, for just as through the disobedience of one man, many were made sinners, so also through the disobedience, so the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. So we see the Israelites, and we see Adam. I want us to practice this morning what I call community prayer, since all of our pastors have been leading into equipping, listening, and developing relationships in this community of faith here at Wellspring. I want you to continue to pray for each other, those of you who are in the chapel and those of you who are in, um, I was going to say Netflix, but YouTube. <laughs> okay. Hi. Because <laughs> I'm on YouTube too sometimes. But anyway, um, practice praying for another as part of your act of obedience, as part of your act of obedience to God. Not to me, not to your pastors. This is to God. For the community of Wellspring, each person matters. Uh, so I want you to think about praying for someone, okay? And now I would like to lead you into a corporate prayer from this person that I, I usually, believe it or not, I had a semester where I, um, I was studying the Benedictine monks. I wanted to be a monk. And all my friends were laughing. They said, you'll never be a monk, Larry. But I like St. Francis Assisi. Okay? So let's hear his prayer. He says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. When there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And all of God's people said, Amen. The second point I'd like to point out this morning, hey, good to see people, just curious this morning here, up here. Um, ingratitude is considering others as disposable. This is what I struggled with. I consider some others as disposable, even God as disposable. And let me, let me emphasize on that point, and let me explore with you on the points that I'm going to make. 
It's disposable is basically it. Those of you who go fast foods, finish, dispose. And it has been said that Americans in general consume about seven or they waste about seven pounds of rubbish, opala, <laughs> from fast foods. I don't know if it's a week or a year or whatever, but seven pounds, that's a lot of rubbish. So it's easy, easily disposed, that's my point. So my, my question to you this morning as I look around and to myself, how many of us have taken God and others for granted? Do we see God and others as disposable? I heard this from a Catholic priest at a wedding ceremony that I attended at St. John's. He was sharing about how marriage can be viewed as disposable. It kind of perked my ear. He shared that when individuals get tired of each other, they just quit on the person and move on. It hit me in the gut as how am I treating God? How am I treating my own family, my friends, my coworkers, and students that I meet every day, and people in my workplace, from the gardeners all the way to staff. Do I see God as a Santa Claus? Do I see individuals as just give me something and bye-bye, aloha no? Okay? Just toss them aside when you're finished interacting with them, or do I value them? The key switching from disposing is not to the growth mindset of valuing them. And what does it mean to value someone? It takes a lot of work. Not, not only the cognitive cerebral concept of it, but to value someone is to add value is mind, body, and soul. Gratitude should impact both our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. Rick Warren said, to appreciate means to raise in value. That's not only true of things. It's true of people. When you appreciate somebody, you literally raise their value. We ought to appreciate people because it increases their self-worth. Make it a regular practice to say thank you to people in your life. Often the people we express gratitude with the least in our lives are those that are closest to us. Quite honestly, most people, including me, are quick to write someone off. But our God is a God of the second chance. Amen? The God of the second chance. Learn from the one who is patient with you, and you learn to be patient with others. As Christ looks, us, looks at us holistically, he knows our hearts, our minds, and our soul, as we are fearfully and wonderfully made in his womb, in our mother's womb. So, shall we value and love others with the help of his Holy Spirit? That's a personal question. Let me drive it a little bit more deeper. Philippians 2, chapter 1 through 4 says, it's a commandment, it's imperative. Paul says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Jesus Christ, if there is any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one of mine. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you, each of us, to the interests of others. Um, you know, from that verse, it hit me, it just came to me um, when it says, being like-minded, how, how, how is that? Thinking like Christ and then expressing what Christ has taught us to be like-minded, everything aligns with what God really wants us to do. So let's take some action steps, okay? Are you ready for some action steps this morning? Okay. Right now, it's very simple. You can bow your heads, but please don't sleep, okay? Bow your heads or whatever position you feel comfortable. I'm going to ask this question, and you're going you're gonna to respond to it mentally, spiritually, emotionally, with your soul. Can you pray for someone in Wellspring right now that you are grateful for or struggling with? 
Can you pray for someone in Wellspring that you are grateful for or struggling with? I'll give you a few moments to do that. Can you now pray for someone outside of the community of Wellspring that you are grateful for or struggling with? Can you pray for someone outside of the Wellspring community that you are grateful for or struggling with? Let's pray together as a community. Almighty and most merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is nothing good in us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us as sinners. Spare us, O God, who confess their faults, our faults. Restore unto us who are penitent according to your promises declared unto men in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that we, may, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of his name. Amen. Now we come to the last point in viewing the attitude of ingratitude. And the last point that I'd like to share that I also struggle with is in ingratitude is failing to acknowledge that God is not finished working in me. Failing to acknowledge that God is not finished working with me. How does this pertain to me, to all of us? Does this really mean that we demand a final outcome right away? Hmm. Let's dive in. Have you ever seen a bumper sticker saying, I'm still under construction, work in progress, or vice versa. I'm still a work in progress under construction. Have you seen that? I saw that recently as I was <laughs> speeding down West Oahu or uh, age three. Somehow my odometer reads six zero or seven zero at times. I don't know. <laughs> Might be dyslexic or something, but that bugger just moves. <laughs> so I saw a bumper sticker that says, I'm still under construction, work in progress. I continually forget that God is not finished working in me yet. Moreover, I create my own personal timeline. Instead of trusting God's timeline, and according to Psalms 102.13, there is a set time for the favor of God to manifest in your life. Time is generally defined in the Greek, again, as two words. Kronos. Can you say Kronos with me? Kronos. And Kairos. Kairos. Okay. Generally denotes God's divine kairos. It, it, it really actually denotes God's divine intervention in our lives to accelerate or to bring some past occurrence or event on our behalf. And chronos basically means chronological time. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. Very sequential. My flesh shouts out the thing to do, demanding that this is the chronos time I want you, God, to bless me. Give it to me now. Give it to me now, God, right now, okay? In the pandemic, there's a lot of things. Give me toilet paper at Costco. No. <laughs> I go, every time I go, man, it's gone. Stop, stop hoarding, you folks. <laughs> anyway, where was I? Okay. <laughs> there is a song I remember singing called, In His Time, In His Time. He makes all things beautiful. Let's remember that Jesus on the cross from our series, remember Cruciform? We had a whole series on the Cruciform, the, the, the Crucifixion. And I got to share on It Is Finished. It's the final slam dunk of the Kairos time for our salvation, the gift of life that's completed in forgiveness, smack right on the cross. That's the Kairos time that Jesus chose. He died and he said, on the third day, what will he do, gang? He will rise. I will rise again. As Christians living in this temporal world, 
I speak for myself about not letting God finish the work in me. Innately, I want to control my outcome. I really want to control my outcome. I struggle with that. Recently, my wife and I were blessed with our first grandchild. Yeah, uh, Mahalo. Her name is Emi Mieko Iseri. And my, my in-law goes, Emi Mieko Iseri, summa cum laude. <laughs> and we were like laughing. I said, like, how dare you curse the child? <laughs> she is so kawaii and cute. And, and I'm excited. I'm so excited that there's many plans whirling in this ADHD's brain, okay? First, I want to control the outcome of my retirement, to retire or not on a certain time. Second, do I move to Washington for an indefinite time? I have plans, but you know the part, right? Where I do, I have the plan, and then I tell God, you bless my plans. <laughs> yeah. Yo, God, bless my plans. I know some of us may not confess it, but we do it, man. Not really, but I'm really reminded that I need to pray that I'll be able to surrender and give wholeheartedly to God all my plans. Have any of you heard of the slipper theology? Slippa. I, I'm not wearing slipper today because I'm preaching. I, I usually get slippers or something, but the slipper theology, have you ever heard of that? Anybody? I'll treat you to McDonald's if you heard of it. Okay. The slipper theology is basically those of you who wear slippers in the house or slippers, put it under your bed, okay? After, when you go to your bed, you put it under your bed, okay? Those from Long's Drugs called local. That's what I have. Um, so in the morning, you get up, you grab your slippers, and you're down on your knees, okay? You're down on your knees, and you start praying. You start praying and, and thanking God for the day. And asking God to empower you so that you can go through the day. That's your slipper theology. Okay, put your slippers on the bed. When you grab it, bend on your knees. It's the only time you get to bend on your knees and pray. There is a scripture that encourages all of us that God is in total control of finishing and completing his plan in us. And I love this. The Apostle Paul echoes in Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray for joy, with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the very first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. So... The power of basically having a positive attitude is basically um, looking at life with your attitude as your behavior towards others and to people with a positive nature. The latest research proves that, oh wait, hold on, oh, did I jump one point? That was the best point, you know, I got to get him, hold on. I so, so, oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> okay, I got him. Um, okay. Paul was expressing, let me, okay. Dude, like my students, go back on your um, video. Go back, okay? So the point now is that God is not finished working with you yet. Paul was saying in that verse of completion that basically the initiation of God's work begun, goes back to the beginning of the believers, our conversion day, that when God worked mightily in the person's life, in our salvation, salvation is always and completely of the Lord. That's one point of that verse. Second is the location of God's good work. In you, it's in us. Sometimes you get sidetracked attempting to find out where God is most at work. Is he working in the world? Is he working in this COVID? Is he working? You can go with all your billion, zillion questions, but yes, God is still working. His major project is people's lives. Another point is the culmination of God's good work. He will complete it. He states that as a matter of fact, Jack. He states it. Okay? What started, God started, constitute the guarantee that he will finish it. In 1 Thessalonians 5.24, 
God will never abandon a project. He will never abandon you. In summary, it's reaching the finish point, gang. I've shared three factors that affect our attitude in becoming ungrateful or with ingratitude. I said disobedience to God. Switch it around. Turn it around. How about obedience to God? Number two, I said consider others disposable and God disposable. How about valuing God and valuing others? And then number three, failing to acknowledge that God is still working in us. How about God is in control? God knows the finish line. God is in control. The outcome of sharing about the attitude of ingratitude truly focuses on our personal attitude. And it focuses on how you look at God and how that's the vertical, the horizontal is how we love and treat others. Years ago, there's this motivational speaker named Zig Ziglar. He said, it is your attitude more than your aptitude that will determine your altitude. It is your attitude more than your aptitude that will determine your altitude. When Zig Ziglar said that, a lot of people saw it as a catch, catchy phrase or a bit of fluff from a mere motivational speaker. After all, Zig Ziglar was a salesman. What did he know? Apparently, he knew quite a lot. The power of positive attitude, the latest research, research proves he was right. In fact, attitude is a better predictor of success than IQ, grade point average, or almost any other factor you can think of. Dr. Martin Sligman, those of you who took psych, proved that his monumental groundbreaking book, Learned Optimism, he found that negative people get sick more often, are divorced more frequently, and raise kids who get into more trouble. But moreover, the scriptures encourages even more about our attitude that is to be like Jesus Christ. Romans 15.5 says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. Wrapping it up with 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17. Rejoice always. Slip a theology. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We ought to rejoice always first, and second, pray continually. And thirdly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let us pray and thank God for teaching us, even though our attitude of ingratitude will turn to be grateful through his word and his spirit. Father, um, thank you for the challenge to us to be obedient to you rather than disobedient. And a challenge to value you and others more than just disposing others at our, at our very whim. Forgive us for that, Lord. Forgive me. And Lord, help us to understand that your Kairos time is more important than our Kronos time. Even in the midst of adversity, you are still there. When things are not healed, when people are going through adversity still, and we still keep on praying, but Lord, your time is always perfect. We believe in you, for you have the power through resurrection. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.